Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting uh, and uh, welcome all uh, to ASPE. Uh, my name is Justin Bassey, the Executive Director here, uh, and uh, welcome to the first of ASPE's 2024 events. Uh, and what better way than to start with a discussion, debate, despair and defence of democracy. This year, national elections will take place in more than 70 countries, including eight out of the 10 of the most populous nations. Fully half of the world's population will be affected. These will vary in their fairness from the European Parliament through to Russia. But whichever the country or the Parliament, it will put democracy to the test as no year has done before. The Swedish VDEM Institute, which studies democracy, concluded last year that the global level of democracy had fallen back to where it was in 1986, before the fall of the Berlin Wall ushered in a wave of democratisation. We're seeing increasing polarisation, increasing apathy and increasing populism from opportunistic politicians whose commitment to, to democracy and liberal values are rubbery at best. At the same time, researchers are seeing increasing generational and even gender divides with too many young people seeing democracy as optional, perhaps not delivering the promise for them that their parents and grandparents felt. And as a very influential article in the Financial Times a fortnight ago noted, young women across a wide range of countries are drifting leftwards, while young men are tilting a bit further right. Or as the New York, New York, New York Times put it, women are from TikTok, men are from YouTube. Which brings us to the role of technology, which is absolutely inseparable from the fate of democracy. The AI guru Stuart Russell recently made the assessment that Russia's 2016 interference in the US election, which costed about $20 million, a bargain really by any measure, could be done today for about $1,000. It's quite terrifying. And we face a twin threat. The first is external, from a group of authoritarian regimes who sense that their time has come, the most dominant being China, but with significant disruptors in Russia, Iran and North Korea. The second is from within our own countries, with a declining self-confidence and a pervading sense that democracy is so imperfect as to be barely indistinguishable from other systems. I wrote recently in an opinion piece that if we destroy ourselves as a democracy, it will be from within, perhaps catalyzed by external pressure, but necessarily self-inflicted. On the eve of World War II, the great champion of democracy, Winston Churchill, said of democracies like Britain, France, and the US, we believe fervently that our institutions are such as to enable us to improve conditions and correct abuses steadily and to march every year and every decade forward, up, 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 forward upon a broader front into a better age. With that task of correcting abuses and marching into a better age, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel for tonight's Democracy Primer. Professor John Dreisick from the Centre for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra. John is also Distinguished Professor at the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis and has previously held positions at the Australian National University, the University of Oregon and the University of Melbourne. Lena Tamang, Director for the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, known as International IDEA for the Asia and Pacific region. She is also a former Secretary General of Finland's Advisory Board for Relations with Developing Countries with the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And she is a member and former chair of the Network Institute for Global Democracy. Chris Saponi is Digital Foreign Editor at The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald newspapers and was an inaugural member of the National Security College's Futures Hub in 2017. His focus has been on hybrid warfare, propaganda and cyber competition. He's written for Nikkei Asian Review and the Economist Intelligence Unit and worked at CNN Money and Fortune. And Dr. Alex Caples is ASPE's Director of Cyber Technology and Security. Alex is a former diplomat and national security official with more than 20 years experience in defense, the Office of National Intelligence and the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet and the Department of Foreign Affairs, including postings to Canada and Afghanistan. And more recently, she's been an Associate Director at professional services firm KPMG. And to moderate tonight's panel, we have ASPE's chair, Gay Brockman. Gay was the MP for Canberra from 2010 to 2019, served as Shadow Assistant Minister for Cybersecurity and Defence, and Shadow Parliamentary Secretary for Defence. And she's a former diplomat and small business owner, 
and today also sits on multiple boards, and none more important than Aspie, of course, Gay. Uh, but thank you very much for being here. I hope you really enjoy it. Uh, and now, uh, really, very many thanks for our distinguished panel for talking about such an important issue. Gay, let me hand over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Justin, and uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, for those here in the room and also those online, I understand there's uh, about 180 online, so <laughs> welcome to you. And uh, you, uh, those online and everyone in the room will get a chance to ask questions at the end of the, um, the panel presentations. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover. These topics are enormous and uh, and Justin has kindly laid down the challenge and also uh, set the scene in many ways, a bit depressing, but uh, he has set the scene. So let's take up that challenge, uh, Justin. So if we can just start by asking each of the panellists, and I'll start with you, John. What are you looking out for this year as we go into all these elections, this sort of worldwide festival of democracy? Right. Okay. I'd be looking for many different things in, in different countries, but the one that worries me most is what's likely to happen in the, the US where the return of Trump seems like a distinct possibility. And that would have been absolutely unthinkable about three years ago after the, uh, the, uh, the attempted insurrection um, after he lost the, uh, the, the last election. Um, so it's in, in, in many ways, this is, this is very surprising. Uh, but it seems that uh, a majority of Republican politicians, especially at the federal level, uh, would be happy to overthrow the results of democratic competition for short-term gain and they've shown that uh, time and time again in recent years um, that we it what we had seen in the us it's often called uh, polarization but it's really it's polarization driven by one side just by the really by the republican side and what, what's happening there um, but when it comes to the mass of voters the polarization tends to be effective rather than issue-based in other words they dislike the other side for who they are not for what they believe in um, and this is, uh, yeah, there's, there's, a real, there's a real possibility there here that, that, um, that if Trump, uh, Trump does win, uh, then the institutions of American democracy in real trouble are in real trouble. And of course, that will have huge implications for the rest of the world. Alex? Well, it's a, it's a cheery start. Um, and I should also say, I know uh, I'm going to have a quick joke here with Justin because he also, he always quotes Churchill, which is... <laughs> Very important statesman, obviously, the great man. Um, but I think it was also Churchill who said that the biggest, the best argument against democracy, essentially, is to spend five minutes with the average voter. So, don't know, which I think gives it an indication of where Churchill stood on the on the matter. But for me, I think uh, I work in cyber tech and security uh, here at ASPE. The things that we tend to look at are really the intersection between technology, cyberspace. Uh, and security policy, if you like. So the things for me are that we'll be looking at specific elections um, for potential and, and actual um, tech-enabled foreign interference, whether that's cyber hacking, that's kind of attempts to, you know, hack into government institutions or uh, voter registration databases, that kind of thing, to, to sway the outcomes of an election or just to destabilise. <laughs> Uh, and the other part of that, of course, which is a big part of ASPE's work, is that we look at foreign influence operations or foreign information operations. So that's misinformation, which is uh, when people are mistakenly passing on inaccurate information, and disinformation, which is when people are deliberately, and when I say people, I mean occasionally that's, that's kind of trolls and um, malicious actors, and occasionally that's state-backed kind of actors, um, deliberately creating narratives that are designed to... Um, to stabilise or, or, or perhaps sway a political outcome. So there's that. And, of course, uh, you cannot be in 2024 and not be thinking about AI. So we're obviously mm. looking at the role that AI plays in both of those um, uh, technical approaches. And then I think across all of those things, we'll also be looking at levels of democratic engagement, particularly for countries where uh, voting isn't mandatory. Um, participation rates and the demographics of participation in elections is often a good proxy for where you think democracy is kind of sitting and the, and the level of engagement in a particular country. I would add that more broadly, one of the things that, that we'll be doing in 2024 is really looking to develop a framework for understanding uh, the impact of those kinds of information operations. Yeah. 
So we, you can track, we often measure things because they're easy to measure. We track mm -hmm. them because they're easy to track. The thing for me is there's all sorts of influence and information operations going on at the moment. Some of them will get traction. Some of them will sink beneath the waves. If you're a government or a civil society organisation looking to know where to put your resources, the kinds of narratives that get traction, how you actually counter some of those narratives, it's really important to understand um, how, when and, and where these these disinformation campaigns take flight. So just on that, what will, we, what will you be looking to include in that framework? So I think you, you're kind of looking at uh, indicators of where you see um, messaging take hold. Yes. Um, for example, you might be looking at doing sentiment analysis, baseline sentiment analysis, that's kind of broad polling, that's tracking responses to things like Twitter accounts and comments and all those kinds of things um, in the lead up to an election. Then on the other side of it, what you're doing is tracking the kind of disinformation campaigns and you're usually seeing that through things like inauthentic social media accounts, that coordinated activity where the same message is coming up time and time again and there are certain indicators that suggest that those accounts are um, both fake and working in a coordinated way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then what you're looking to do is to see when and how those messages start to change the response on social media platforms or when you see that uh, be picked up in things like mainstream media, which is increasingly the case because that divide between social media and mainstream media is increasingly uh, diminishing. And, and do you have a baseline from past elections that you were working on, particularly that change, where you're seeing that change? It's a moving story because mm. I think that the narrative that you get, you know, in the, in the lead up to something like the Indonesian election, mm. what happened in the last election is almost kind of dead and gone. Time has moved on so, yeah. so much. Uh, the, the candidates are different, the issues are different. So it is a sort of a real time setting. Setting, yeah, exactly. Mm. Chris. What are you looking for? Well, so first I just want to say I'm speaking on behalf of myself and not my employers. Looking at these elections uh, this year, particularly in liberal democracies, the thing that I'm really going to be looking out for is center-right parties and where they stand. Some of them appear to be sort of floundering. Uh, and they're in the wilderness a, a bit. Uh, you know, how much are they embracing sort of new, new change uh, and new policies? And how much are they embracing extremism? basically mainlining it. And that seems to be a trend that we're seeing, obviously, in the US. We're seeing it to a lesser degree in the UK. We're seeing it through Europe. So that's one area where I'll look very closely and, and follow. On the left, I would say, or on center left parties, I'd say, can they, can they deliver for their, for their voters? I think of an anecdote that Joe Biden had uh, said about how his father had told him that I don't expect the government to solve my problems, but I do expect my government to understand what they are. I think that is a very insightful look into this drift that we've had in liberal democracy over the past, uh, past few decades. And it came into a crisis in 2016 with the election of Donald Trump and with the Brexit referendum. So those are the areas that I'll be watching. And I think that there's sort of a search, sort of a groping for the new norms. And, uh, and it's going to be finding that new middle. And we can see, for instance, in, in Germany, the, uh, the right, the far right party alternative for Deutschland, they've been surging in the polls ahead of some regional elections. So there's a sense that the Germans, as they are facing a tougher economy, are looking for simpler solutions, nostalgic solutions. Then the news comes out that members of the AFD were uh, in meetings with further right extremists that were planning on mass expulsion, They're working up plans for mass expulsions of migrants. This set off alarm bells for a lot of Germans, and then suddenly you had big demonstrations against the AFD. I think it's a very, uh, it's a very telling uh, set of uh, events that's happening there, and that's where the sort of the the, the moving line of you know of differences in these democracies. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, and Lena. Yeah, thank you. No doubt uh, this year will be one of the important um, for holding elections in, in decades. And yet somehow it doesn't feel like a festival of democracy, probably for the reasons uh, outlined by Justin in his introduction. And given the, given the fact that we have an outright war going on in Europe, uh, Middle East, Africa and in Asia too. Um, 
But what to look out for, apart from potentially very interesting political outcomes, I would pay attention also to the integrity of the electoral processes. Um, and if there is one singular threat to in integrity of elections this year, it is probably the platform of digital um, risks of different nature, what role of digital information, AI, disinformation play in these elections, as, as Alex already uh, pointed out. But in there, I would say that there is one country, Taiwan, to, for all of us to study and look out. Um, I think they have a great experience already early this year elections, um, demonstrating the authorities' capacity to really pre-bunk and debunk uh, various information operations that they have been uh, target of. And of course, they've been practicing for, for a long while. Um, secondly, um, I would be interesting to see how far the autocrats seek to contest elections. We will be seeing the elections in Russia and Iran, among other non-democracies. Last year in Cambodia, Myanmar Junta is discussing about organizing elections. And we have this peculiar phenomenon where the autocrats are going through the motions, certain motions of elections, even organizing debates and discussions. We are likely to see Vladimir Putin answering the questions from, uh, from, the, from the audience. And some of these in elections are interesting, not in terms of perhaps guessing who is going to win, but what else might emerge, no matter how small the space may be. And I'm here thinking of last year elections in, in Thailand, for example, where um, in spite of all the electoral engineering by the, <coughs> by the uh, ruling uh, party, or the, at the time the government, a new uh, democratic opposition uh, managed to win the elections. They didn't manage to form a government, but they are in the parliament and probably changed the scenery of uh, Thai politics uh, for, for good. Or recent presidential elections in, in Guatemala, where a new fresh president emerged, uh, emerged uh, uh, people's choice emerged in spite, even if the ruling elite tried to do its utmost to prevent that. And thirdly, lastly, um, even if we have uh, more than 2 billion potential voters, we know that far, far less will be uh, voting. Um, voter turnouts may be very, remain very low in some places due to intimidation, risk of electoral violence, difficulties of getting themselves uh, registered. Bangladesh, recent elections, official voter turnout was, I think, around 41, and even that is considered rather generous uh, estimate. Even in India, with much higher voter turnouts, there is a big amount of population, all internal, external, out of con uh, migrants or people who are out of um, out of the uh, polling stations who are missing from the from the polls. So there are many structural hindrances for people to be able to vote. And then, of course, we have the whole phenomena of uh, voter apathy. Um, European Parliament elections have normally had this voter turnout around 30% or so. This year may be different, given the, um, the rise of the far-right parties and the fact that these elections um, are taking the temperature of this, uh, of this wave. Mm -hmm. So just, it can, just on that scale sort of registration and, and people attempting to register and not being able to register, can you just give us some idea just of your observations and your experience internationally? about what sort of percentages we're talking about? What's the scale here? Oh, that's a hard uh, one uh, in terms of percentages. But uh, yes, what we um, over the last... Being uh, alienated, disempowered. Yeah. In, in, indeed. I mean, one is the, the very electoral uh, rules and registration about uh, where you need to be at the time of registration or at the time of, of polling, uh, ever uh, changing electoral rules about this, about this matter. Um, and of course, the very fact that the uh, over the last uh, five years or so, uh, the role of opposition has been weakened in um, in many contexts. Um, and um, I cannot tell you now the numbers of such, uh, where, uh, but that is a really widespread phenomena of trying to or strategy by by often governments trying to make the. Uh, harder to either register or appear on the polling day. Um, the COVID era introduced a lot of different uh, new innovations on this regard mm. in certain countries, the kind of special voting arrangements, as they called. 
advanced voting, telephone voting, postal voting, and so on. And many of those have been introduced, and it would be interesting to see if how much they, these will live on uh, to this year's and uh, elections in years to come. So COVID, in terms of the access to democracy, did that improve it? I mean, were there systems introduced that actually... In many countries, yes, they did. And I yeah. think the anticipation was that the voter turnouts would remain, uh, would drop dramatically. Yes, yes. In certain places it did. But for example, I think the Korean elections, presidential elections, uh, we saw the uh, record high voter turnouts and they were not, uh, they did not uh, impact the voter turnouts as it was uh, maybe maybe was the fear and a lot of different special voting arrangements i think in australia as well the telephone mm -hmm. voting was expanded to new different groups whether that will stay like that in the mm -hmm. next elections to be to be seen um and i think the uh, sort of advanced voting mechanisms uh been introduced in several several places we have a website on on this uh, information about all the new <laughs> new uh, new measures that have been um have been adopted and a lot of experiments on the on the internet voting which of mm. course remains problematic but there yes, are yeah. a lot of, uh, a lot of mm. uh, pilots on that as well okay i think it's it's also attitude isn't it i mean it's that kind of a, there's that i was going to say there's that great stat but actually it's not a good statistic it's it's something like a third of, of millennials in the us don't feel that it's essential to live in a democracy which i think speaks to a degree of perhaps whether that's taking that for granted or whether that is disengagement from a process or perhaps not feeling that a democracy is delivering on what they need it to do. But that's a startling statistic for a first world affluent nation. Mm. And we saw a figure like that some a few years back here, I think, from the Lowy poll. Mm. I think things have improved in terms of the... I hope so. Yeah, I, yeah one would hope. But uh, yeah, that was mirrored here too some time, a few years ago. So, Lena, can I just stay with you, um, just moving on now. So, what are the trends that have got us to this, this point that we're at now in terms of, um, you know, the integrity of electoral systems being under question in terms of sort of participation and regist um, yeah, pr registration being, uh, being denied people, um, the, the issues that have been raised by people in terms of that alienation, that disenfranchisement, that disengagement. From your perspective, what has got us to this point? What are the trends um, sort of over the last decade? And also, um, how has that landscape changed over the last decade? And what do you see in the future? Uh, well, um, maybe start with the first one. What is the what is the landscape? I mean, I think it's uh, it was mentioned in the intro as well. Um, all indices, including that of ours, uh, global state of democracy indices of international idea. Uh, saying the telling the same picture of confirming that democracy has continued to uh, weaken over the last ten years, and of course, as a footnote, if we take particularly in Asia Pacific region, if we take a time frame of say thirty years, uh, yesterday was not better in in Asia and the, and the Pacific region. But of course, worryingly, there has been many declines in terms of or in two of the bedrocks of uh, democratic governance, credible elections and effective uh, parliaments. And we are to see whether this negative trend will continue over this over this super year of elections. And of the countries that are going to polls this year, the biggest declines on these two were in India in, and, and Tunisia. Um, likewise, of course, there have been uh, significant declines on when it comes to freedom of expression, mm -hmm. uh, freedom of assembly, association present in all regions. But there have also been some improvements, and uh, particularly on when it comes to efforts to weed out uh, corruption, um, especially in Africa, but also in parts of Asia and Pacific. Gains being somewhat limited, uh, but uh, there are some signals of, of positive change that would need to be uh, supported to maintain. But the, the real bulwark against the sort of democratic deterioration, apart from the from people's uh, protests and participation, has found in the presence of what is called the countervailing institutions, um, depending on the context, with judiciary uh, or presence of in the informal 
formal independent uh, institutions, anti-corruption bodies, and and so on. Um, but yeah, no, the, but it doesn't look very bright at the moment. And what us, what got us here, um, probably reasons are many. Uh, but I would just pick up the as a, someone working on the on the on the democratic um, institutions. Um, I think democracies have not been very good at uh, taking care of the, the the sort of foundations or the some of the checks and making sure that uh, against the backsliding of of democracies um, they left maybe too many uh, loopholes to be uh, to be adv taken advantages they became maybe a bit too complacent um, so that the backsliding leaders were able to take some same advantage of of that okay so so could just give us some examples of that and um, what should uh, democracies have been doing in terms of uh, keeping people on side <laughs> well I mean to remember I mean these when you say uh, backsliding uh, leaders uh, we mean leaders who have come to power through elections and through legal means and once only once in power maybe start uh, hollowing or undermining and changing the changing the rules of the uh, uh, game sometimes very slowly sometimes more uh, more quickly and poor institutional design can make their path much easier uh, whereas mm. the stronger uh, institutional design uh, can um, can be the sort of a uh, serve as a as resisting such um such efforts um and i think one good example is probably the um of hungarian uh, change of hungarian constitution where in 2010 when fides came to power it discovered that actually you need um you uh you would need two third uh, to amend the constitution or uh, four fifth in order to four fifth of majority to do uh do away the constitution and do a totally new constitution mm. um, and two third to amend the constitution so uh, they didn't have the four fifth majority but they did have a two third majority so amending the constitution so that we don't need that requirement of four fifth so you might think that this is a poor uh, poor drafting of the constitution hard to say whether it would have happened anyways uh, through other means, uh, whether uh, but but anyhow, that is probably uh, one of the good examples of um, um, how how when the institutional design really matters. But at the same time, I think um, if there is a one superpower that democracies have, it is its capacity to self-correct and uh, change the course. Mm -hmm. um, references were made to Second World War, but democracies have. Yeah. Managed to survive um, the the world wars and pandemics and uh, um, the um, a lot of uh, and I think there is that capacity that uh, that needs to be there, but but I, and I think the history shows that the um, democracy has, has can survive, but as long as these core democratic norms are remain protected, uh, I think there is a line that you may fall under. Yes and then it is hard to solve it so what are those core norms well every those uh, pillars. yeah every uh, society every context you would need to obviously define uh, what what are your core democratic norms but normally it would be around uh, be it around um, uh, safe safeguarding regular elections uh, making sure you have term limitations Making sure uh, touching that touching let, let's say touching fundamental rights would could trigger a, a, a process that would require extra majorities or would require a process of um, of delaying compulsory compuls consultations and and uh, and so on. But they would normally be around these core institutions of parliament, judiciary, elections, um, but also independence of. Uh, of the of the institutions i think the tricky thing is that of course you would need to have a sort of bipartisan support for mm -hmm. uh for protecting those core norms and you would normally um 
fix your roof when it's shining, when the sun is shining and you actually don't know when it's actually start. Uh, oftentimes you don't know this when the bad weather is about to approach. So that's the, would urge all the, all these societies, countries, contexts to start such a process with, to constitutional review process or through, through other mechanisms of yeah. protecting that call. Great, thank you. I'll come, I just want to talk about later um, with all of you about this sort of capacity to self-correct and what would be the catalyst for that, but we'll just keep working through this question. So Chris, yeah, what are the trends that have got us here from your perspective, uh, particularly interested in your views on sort of economic issues and um, societal issues and technology, of course, and uh, what do you, what's the current projection, do you think? Well, I mean, it's interesting, some of the statistics that you gave about youth that are disengaged from democracy and don't believe that it's important. I mean, these are, the, these are this is polling that's been done in the post-Cold War era. So the last time democracy really had to defend itself as a system was yep. during the Cold War. Yep, yep. And if you go back to that time, the economy it was much stronger for a lot of that, right? Going into the, from, from the immediate end of World War II, well into the 70s. So if you had to defend liberal democracy, you could point to the rising standards of living. That's been long gone. And in, that, in, the, in the past, say, 25 years, we've been in this period of unbridled globalization. So massive disruptions in the economies, massive dis digital disruption, with the expectation that citizens are just supposed to absorb this. And I think that's created this sort of gulf of, uh, of difference in expe expectations and outcomes. And I think that's where there's sort of this, this drag on sentiment and, and belief in democracy, because it's not the, the lived experience, to use that term, is, is not, uh, it's not delivering for many people. Yes, yes. And I think that that's the way people feel. The other thing is this tech change, the fact that now we're, we're basically living you know, via our digital experience. It's very easy to become almost medieval about the way you see other groups. You're no longer, it's no longer the politics of representation, it's the politics of mobilization. So it's very easy to, you see a politician, they're making a decision, you can track every utterance that they make. And you could say, no, I do it this way, he's wrong, he doesn't understand. And in a sort of a cybernetic way, it's, you know, this is the experience of it. It's much more adversarial, it's much more paneled into your, your block of, you know, your tribe, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you could roll back the clock 50 years and you could see the way that the media worked, you could see the way that society worked, individuals, workers were represented by unions. They were, they, if they had a problem, they wrote a letter to the editor or to their MP. And there was a very strong level of representation, but also the institutions were strong. Instead, this tech change that, we've, that we're all living through has structurally weakened institutions. And the, the race, I think, is on now to get the, the forces that are friendly to democracy to re-articulate the way our societies work in a way that supports the, a democratic outcome. So basically, it's not going to look like the past, but the outcome will be you know, respectful of human rights. It will be uh, uncoerced. There will be, a, you know, there will be a, you know, the free will of the people. The people will actually be guiding things. It's just going to look a lot different than it would have if you went back 50 years ago, because these things, you know, they function differently. Again, talking about the U.S. election, I saw um, Joe Biden got the endorsement of a key uh, auto union. But I don't know how much that matters now as it would have 50 mm. years ago, mm. because there can be lots of union members who feel culturally very much out of step with the White House, with the Democrats, with left-wing politics in the U.S. So it, it doesn't have the same you know, power that an endorsement would have had in, in the past. And I think, again, we're just living in this, it's an atomized experience, but it's also somewhat medieval in a way. Yeah, and union membership is declining. Mm. Because the industries have declined. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the Taylor Swift endorsement that matters now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ge genuinely it does. The yeah. outsized influence of influences. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Just, just about the, the tribes that people are just talking in kind of an echo chamber. I mean, how do, how do you penetrate those groups to try and get a broader discussion going? I mean, you can see it now. I mean, there's a learning curve going on with, with parties, uh, with center left parties, which is they realize they have to get to, they, ha they have to connect to these people. Uh, the, the center right and far right has been very good at mobilizing people around grievance issues. The center left 
they have to figure out a way to, to talk to them. So you see this discussion of Joe Biden seeking the endorsement of Taylor Swift. It's to try to get across as, you know, to as many people as possible. But I do think that there's a learning curve there. If you go back to 2016 and you see the way that the, the uh, Remain campaign would have communicated in the Brexit referendum or the Hillary Clinton campaign communicated with their potential or their would-be voters. Mm -hmm. uh, it was much more staid. It was, we're making these statements. We want your support. Uh, now they understand that they need to have constant engagement. They need to break through that wall and be there. And, and it's sort of politics that are sort of infused with culture. The worry with this is that everybody stays in such a state of agitation and mobilization that you get things like you get the Taylor, the talk of Taylor Swift, and then this idea on the right that there, that Taylor Swift is involved in some deep state plot with the CIA. It just starts to become, you know, off topic, and it and it really gets away from delivering, uh, delivering, uh, you know, a good outcome for the citizens of a society. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I do think the learning curve is there, and you can see it through even political consultants that they realize that they have to get to these audiences. Uh, you, the influencers matter. Influencers have the ears, the attention of people. So, so yeah, there, there is a learning curve, but it, it is a matter of, you know, but, you know. Does that, does that learning curve take us down a good path, though? Because I guess I'm thinking plus one everything you just said. Um, absolutely. But that, that kind of idea that almost with that ability to directly track politicians and directly engage pol politicians where they are, um, we are holding them to the standards of direct democracy, mm. but we're actually still trapped in representative de democratic structures and processes. Now, both of those are ideals, obviously, and neither of them are kind of ever achievable 100%, but it, there seems to be that mismatch. Sure, and there's examples of elected politicians that are very much at the mercy of their core base, so they have to embrace ideas that are no-go ideas, but they have to embrace them to satisfy those that are going to be the most engaged. Um, it's interesting, if you go back into the, in the 1940s, there was a lot of thinking about the way culture worked with democracy. This was during World War II. Uh, and there was an understanding that, that in order to have a democratic experience, the human had to be able to not be overwhelmed by the media that they were encountering. And, and that, that goes to your point. So how do you allow space for that sort of the reasoning, thinking, contemplative human being to stand back and say, I feel this very strongly, but you know, the rational part of me says, it's better to maintain good ties with my neighbors and to not embrace these radical ideas. It, the current social media experience and adding AI, TikTok and all that, it can be intoxicating. It can be overwhelming. So, but that's the sort of strategic thing that maybe communicators you know, that are democratic communicators understand. You need to have that moment to be able to pull back and, and to have that sort of, the more reasoned uh, experience of the world. Is that rewarded though? On social media platforms, probably not. No. <laughs> <laughs> and not by, not by advertisers either. No, so, yeah. no exactly right. Uh, Alex, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm sorry, I had some notes on this and it looks like a ransom note because I forgot my glasses, so. Um, I kind of wanted to make a couple of points on the on the general information landscape, I guess, and then a couple of points on where I think that's taken us. But yeah. some of this overlaps very much so because I think this, this recognition of the media space and the information space is um, driving the pace of politics in a way that it never has yes. done before. But I think essentially... What I was saying previously is that, that basic, the basic ideas of democracy and democratic processes haven't really changed that much, and yet technology has profoundly changed the way we generate and access and consume information, and it's profoundly changed the ways in which that information is distributed and monetized. and that's really, I think, a key point there as well, which is that the internet has kind of made everybody their own journalist. Everybody can have a podcast. Everybody can write a blog, all of those things. Now, obviously, people prioritise within, within those spaces, but essentially everybody is both a consumer and a potential node of information dissemination uh, without necessarily having perhaps the sorts of standards of journalistic um, fact-checking, integrity, retractions, all those sorts of things, codes of conduct mm. that we would expect it's very hard in that maelstrom to identify and be confident in uh, authoritative voices. So you end up with that sense of not necessarily being able to, that we simultaneously have more and more information and we're less and less sure what's true. Yes, yes. Um, and so that's a really interesting kind of development, I think. Um, 
the other thing I think is that the key nodes of, of disseminating information, so social media platforms and even digital media platforms who are driven by, often by syndication, but equally by, uh, you know, that real need to be on top of, of the news cycle, which is, you know, minute to minute as opposed to making the six o'clock print, print deadline that it would have been 20 years ago. Um, they aren't designed necessarily to achieve democratic outcomes. They're not incentivised necessarily to pursue democratic aims. So um, it's really on the user, if you like, or the consumer to think about those sorts of things. What I mean by that kind of economic incentive is, is that algorithms like likes, that's, that's their design. They essentially are not going to feed you anything that they think you're not going to like, and they're not going to feed you anything that necessarily introduces contestable information into your world because their reward system is clicks and likes. So they're going to feed you what they think is going to render them clicks and likes. Um, and to that extent, you know, you'll probably all heard that phrase, echo chambers, but it takes people potentially down, uh, you know, mm. I think opinion will be divided, Meta and X may come after me for this one, but it can take uh, people down that path of only really um, being, being well read, but not necessarily being widely read, if that makes sense. They're not really introducing a whole lot of new information into their world. And over time, that can harden into some pretty set positions and it can push people into those, I guess what Chris was yeah, saying there, yeah. those positions of extremism or, Extremes, or yeah. not even extremism, but just a sense of um, not being challenged yeah. and, and hardening your kind of role. Mm. So when we know that kind of politically motivated or ideologically motivated, um, even sort of just trolls are essentially in that world, playing in that world, heavily engaged in using social and online media content to shape kind of outcomes, whether those are political or otherwise, from an algorithm's point of view and from a social media platform's point of view, that is also traffic. So, so that is a, a sort of a net benefit unless and until the pressure from society suggests that you need to remove or moderate that content. So the, the, the onus then falls on the consumer and the consumer is, as an individual very often. Yes, yes. Um, so I think the results of that are you end up with that over, overwhelming amount of information which can be polarising, but equally you end up with people who are so overwhelmed by the information that they get off all their socials, they, they disengage from the streams of, of information that um, they find too much. And then it's actually quite difficult to find other sources of information yes, yeah. that are as real time and all those sorts of things. Uh, and Chris talks about that being addictive and it, and it really is, we, we know that. Um, and as I say, that kind of truth being harder to discern, to discern and easier to distort. The other thing I think, just as a, an aside about the technological development, set aside the information space, but you have a growing digital divide in terms of people's access to uh, good internet, to, you know, which is essentially the foundation and will be the future foundation of economy, society, um, the internet and connectivity in a digital economy is really our lifeline. And if you're living in a geographic area, even in parts of Australia, you, you are going to miss out. If you are at a, of an older demographic, you may not be as digital, digitally literate. Um, and so your world starts to narrow. Mm. All right, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm a social scientist, amongst other things, and uh, I think some of what this discussion needs is a, a cold, cold bath of <laughs> social science. Um, so, us some joy, John. Uh, filter bubbles and uh, echo chambers, um, very popular, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of laments about them. Mm -hmm. uh, my colleague Axel Bruns, who's an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow at uh, QUT, um, media researcher, um, has surveyed the evidence on uh, echo chambers and filter bubbles and concluded that there is uh, no empirical evidence for them that stands up to, to scrutiny. Um, so it's, it's very easy to, to talk about them and to in, in, in present them in plausible terms, but um, at least uh, his systematic study suggests that they're, uh, they're not a problem. Um, laments about disengagement and uh, lack of commitment to democracy. Uh, this, I've, I've been around a long time. Um, I can remember <laughs> uh, very similar discussions uh, to, to this um, back in the 1970s when people were lamenting, oh, we've had this, uh, uh, this, this sudden fall of uh, 
uh, what, what was the post-war uh, prosperity for everyone and then suddenly things have changed. There's sort of massive insecurity, democracy is in trouble, the crisis of democracy has arrived. And that was, uh, that's 50 years ago. Um, and things did, uh, obviously things, uh, uh, things didn't quite collapse uh, when it came to democracy. In fact, that was the, uh, the beginning of the biggest wave of democratization the world has ever seen. Um, so I, I think we need to be uh, careful in what we look at uh, to subject plausible statements about the way the world is going to a, a, a bit of um, scrutiny as to whether the, uh, the evidence really does back that up. Um, and, and try and think, well, I mean, obviously there's many democracies and many different trends in, in mm. different places and, and sort of trying to figure out what the, uh, what the, what the key, uh, what the key trends are. And I think one, one I would highlight, which is, I, I think, uh, 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 Chris did mention is, uh, uh, rising inequality, um, sort of massively rising inequality in, um, in the Western democracies over, over the years. And, and in some cases, the, uh, the abandonment, essential abandonment of the working class by parts of the center left. And I think uh, that's uh, sort of exemplified by the, uh, what we can call the progressive neoliberalism of the Clintons in the US, where um, the emphasis is on recognition of, uh, of, of, of minority, well, on the basis of, uh, on the basis of, 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 of gender, um, of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or whatever, and what gets left out is the uh, is, is the working class, which of course was the the bedrock of uh, of the centre left, and and so people who would traditionally have voted Democrat um, uh, feel so that, that there's nothing there for them anymore, and they're, they're happily to to move not just to Trump because the movement was already taking place before Trump, yes. before populism. Um, they're, they're, they, they see they see nothing for them that the Democrats can give them in terms of securing material living conditions that they once they once had, and so uh, the, the, the the well the, the really the false remedies of um, of, uh, of, of well not just Trump but other Republicans uh, become uh, become attractive to them. So is it is it a, uh, a lack of faith in certain parties, or is it a lack of faith in government generally? Because I think that is a really interesting kind of conversation. Yeah. Um, I, I would, well, in, in terms of explaining the shift in, in working class voters uh, gradually over time from Democrat to Republican in, in, in the US, um, I think that's a lack of faith in, in a particular party, because uh, I, I think if you had a lack of faith in democracy completely, you probably wouldn't vote. Okay, um, well, that's right. Rather yeah. than... Uh, yeah. Okay, Chris. I was just going to say on that, I mean, there's also this sort of, I think, because of the change in the economy, there's this privileging of identity because we live through our information so if you're a working class voter and the system isn't working for you at least you can vote for brexit and stick it to the stick it to the know-it-alls in the south of the uk or you can vote for trump and make all those suits in washington sweat because this guy speaks for you and so you're getting a gratification from the identity even if the the economic you know the the economic offering is not going to be that that different. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think I think that's something else that needs to be looked at is that when we talk about democracy, what is the shared identity of democracy? And right now, it is, as John says, a lot of it is is um, divided along various I, you know identity lines, and there's got to be some sort of shared uh, identity that can be participated in. And we, we've seen glimpses of that a little bit, I think, when the Russians started or Vladimir Putin began the full scale war of. Ukraine, there was this rallying to Ukraine around this idea of sovereignty, uh, democracy. democracy, even though <laughs> Ukraine obviously is a, you know, it's a, a emerging democracy, but there was this idea that there's this contest of values and that, and, and very quickly, a lot of the imagery, imagery around that was, was absorbed into the global democratic conversation. Yeah. Obviously things have now shifted, but so we get glimpses of it, but it's not a sustained thing. And I think that if somebody can sort of crack that code, then we might have a much more sustainable view of democracy in the digital world, because we wouldn't be thinking that it's just some, you know, that it's just the narrow interest of one particular voting block versus another. Mm -hmm. So this is a nice sort of point to actually turn to well, what now? Um, what are the solutions? We've heard of the many, many challenges, the economic challenges and forces uh, against democracy, the technology forces, the economic forces, the societal forces. Uh, what, what now? What do we do about it? Who should do what? Uh, what's the solution? Um, and, and just to Lena's point, I mean, how do we self-correct? Uh, does it require a crisis? 
uh, to actually be the catalyst for that or is it um, is the, the opportunity there now and we should um, take it with both hands? So, John, can I just start with you? Um, yeah, okay. There's, 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 I mean, I think a lot could be said. Um, um, let, let me just stay with the, U, the US for, for a moment. And uh, there, there's, there's all kinds of, um, I mean, the, 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 basic, the basic problem with the system, it seems that the, the constitutional system there is failing, that the very things it was designed to protect against in terms of the rise of um, populist, uh, populist demagogues, um, it seems to be facilitating that a, a system that was designed to project, protect against the tyranny of the, of the majority has enabled the a tyranny of a minority to emerge. Um, so in, in terms of in, t in terms of what we might do, we can think well, think about things at multiple levels, and one of them is the institutional level. And uh, we actually have a, a number of institutions in Australia which the, the U.S. could really deal could could really benefit from, um, and would be in many ways a, a solution to their their, their current uh, constitutional crisis. Uh, what do we have that they don't? We have compulsory voting. It means that you can't win elections by just mobilising the extremes. Um, we have preferential voting. Um, we have an independent electoral commission, and we have no direct primaries. And um, all of those things, um, I think, provide Australia protection against what's what we see in the in the US. Um, and you might think, well, uh, okay, none of those things are, are feasible. How could they possibly be introduced in the US? Compulsory voting, probably not. That's just that would be a bridge too far to mm -hmm. them. Uh, preferential voting. Um, not only can be, it has been introduced in the US in, in, um, in, in a couple of states um, to, to good effect. Um, there they call it ranked choice voting. And so, um, I mean, it'll take me a while to explain the mechanics, but um, so in the state of Alaska, for example, they uh, introduced uh, preferential voting with, a, they combined it with an open primary, so no party primaries, an open primary, top four candidates go through to the, the general election, preferential voting. Result, uh, Lisa Murkowski, moderate Republican, easily beats the pro-Trump Republican. If they had the same electoral system as in most states for the Senate, um, Lisa Murkowski would have lost. And she was a Republican who voted for the impeachment of Trump, uh, but she's still a senator, and won in, won in 2022. Um, how was that introduced? Um, through a citizen-initiated referendum. Um, and that, uh, that, that route is possible in a number of American states. The state of Michigan introduced a, an, a an independent citizens redistricting commission through similar means. And so no gerrymandering in Michigan as a result. Um, so uh, institutional change is possible um, and could, in, in this case, at least in the US, um, could potentially have massive effect, but it could only be done on a state by state basis and probably only in the states which, um, which have citizen initiated referendum as, the, as one constitutional mechanism. Um, there's, there's a lot more I could say, but uh, okay, I'll, I'll finish that. Thanks for that. There's a few tips there. Alex. Uh, I guess a couple of things, if you're looking specifically at elections um, and, and something that all governments can and, and probably should do in order to avoid some of the kind of post-the-fact arguments where, where you, you know, there's, it's difficult to prove the case either way, but essentially to ensure that any software or hardware that is part of the process of, of processing electoral results so if that's voter registration databases, if that's actual electoral machines in cases where you've got people who are not turning up with a pencil and a democracy sausage, if you're um, uh, looking at the kind of counting and, and where the database of actual votes counted sits, all of that needs to be secured, accredited. Uh, essentially what you're doing is introducing security by design into the electoral process, essentially. And that's part of what the cybersecurity strategy is doing anyway. The idea of security by design is something we'll be hearing a lot more of over the course of the next uh, couple of years. Um, essentially trying to uh, have developers and service providers and other platforms internalise a lot of the externalities that have previously and, and risks that have previously been pushed out mm. to consumers or users. Mm. I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. I think if I had to say one other thing that was sort of a more long long term, there's obviously lots of things again, but um, education. Education is essentially the bedrock of democracy and an understanding not just of democratic processes and, and why we should value it, but equally, uh, I guess, um, introducing things like critical thinking so that critical people thinking, really gosh. understand the kind of, when you're looking at information, 
having a, a sense of how you might be able to test that, check that, uh, really to kind of introduce a degree of, I suppose, cynicism and, cred and credulity yeah, into, yeah. A healthy to uh, your understanding of the information space. T teach it the way you teach sex education in schools, teach teach uh, young people to engage. They're back to civics in some ways, but but if for an online world, I really think that would make a, an enormous difference okay. in a relatively short period of time. Well, so do you think just on the, the civics education so far has been very basic and, and not geared to the current to I, the environment. I, f I mean, I won't speak for all the curriculums yeah, uh, yeah. or any of that sort of thing, but I, I think that there's a, a sense that you tend to do your civics in the sense of, okay, so this is separation of powers, this is yep, the social okay. contract, so, yes, yep. uh, and everybody sort of writes that down and, and goes through that. But in terms of actually understanding what that means um, for you, how that might relate to your lived experience, to use that phrase, yes. which is... Um, I don't think we do that particularly well and I, and I think that is a slightly different course of education than it is to say and actually don't believe everything you read and actually this is why that's important. So it's, it's linking the idea of testing information and fact-checking and having the sort of critical thinking skills that you need that are good in, in life regardless but linking that specifically to the, to the idea of uh, democracy and societal values. Mm -hmm. Great. Chris. So uh, for an outlook for what, what could possibly change, I mean, I think we've had a lot of emphasis on reforming institutions and saying institutions aren't fit for for purpose at this time yes, because yes. things have changed so much. And that is definitely one component of it. But I think that we shouldn't we shouldn't forget that, you know, the desire for to live uh, freely in an uncoerced society where we our human rights are, are are respected. I mean, that's that's a broad desire, and for many of us, it's sort of a universal desire. And I think if we emphasize more of that, it's a pathway into speaking to many different people with many different identities and backgrounds. And I think if there was more emphasis in that and telling that sort of story, it could make a real difference in in rearticulating liberal democracy for the future and other democracies as well. Uh, I mean, I know that probably sounds like, you know, a, sort of a bit of a cop out, but I mean, it is, I think that, I think that we've had an over, especially since the, the elections of 2016, an overemphasis on the fragility of institutions. But I actually think institutions can be resilient. There has to be the, re, there has to be the confidence in them. And, and I feel that there's been this sort of blow to the confidence of a lot of democracy citizens because of obvious events. I mean, seeing the January 6th insurrection would, would do that. But, you know, in a way, I mean, there are times when democracy was under s severe pressure uh, by uh, rivals in the past, totalitarianism, communism and the like. And it's a matter of reestablishing a, a sort of a shared civic faith in this system. And I think that's possible. And I think once you do that, a lot of the other answers will start to fall into place, including how to reform institutions. So could I just I'll put you on the spot here? How do you do that? And John, you, you mentioned the fact that we've, sort of, we've been around this boy before, so 50 years ago. So mm -hmm. how did we go about re-establishing the faith in democracy 50 years ago? So can I put you on the spot first, Chris? Well, what, what I would say is 50 years ago, going into the time of Thatcher and Reagan, it became emphasising libertarian freedoms of the market. So now it's a matter of emphasising other types of freedoms. I mean, so free and, and really finding out what would make people feel more free. And I think in a lot of cases, people are feeling uh, isolated or feeling abandoned by society, by their government. How do you get to these people and ensure that they've got a place in society? And, and I think you're seeing this with institutions mentioning unions. Now there are unions that are much more focused on individual contractors because that's the reality for a lot of people. So it's no longer showing up at a big factory. It's somebody working on their own. So these sorts of things, and then building that sort of democratic solidarity uh, and showing that, that freedom isn't just isn't just taking away restrictions, it's actually providing some sort of basis of some sort of baseline support. And I don't mean necessarily welfare, but some sort of rhetorical support for the legitimacy of the experience of, of people that are living in this modern economy that is incredibly atomized and, and divisive. Yeah, I, I mean, John, sort of 50 years ago, so well, even before yeah. that, sort of cold, it was Cold War, post-war, Cold War environment, so we had sort of yeah. a defined enemy. Was that, was that the rallying call for democracy? Is it? it oh, wow. uh, 
Yeah, I mean, of course, the, the defined energy, the, the well-defined enemy eventually collapsed under its own weight, and that, uh, and then, of course, the available, the available alternative was liberal democracy plus capitalism, which worked <laughs> well in very different ways in some of the uh, the, 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 po the post-Soviet states. Um, um, but if, but if I think, um, I mean, I, I, I honestly don't know what the lesson of that <laughs> that sweep of history, seventies, eighties, nineties, is when it comes to things that can actually be done consciously. I mean, a lot of things happened that weren't necessarily designed, um, and then some of the things that were done. I'm, th I'm thinking of the, the wave of neoliberalism, in, uh, uh, especially under Thatcher and Reagan. Those those things weren't good for democracy. Um, I mean, it was some, in in some ways. Uh, a lot of authoritarianism was necessary um, in the you know union union smashing in Britain, for example, to um, um, in connection with neoliberal reforms. But let me just um, sort of bring perhaps things up up, up to date. Um, I mean, the communicative environment today is very different, uh, uh, even despite what I said about filter bubbles and uh, um, and echo chambers earlier. Uh, so it is different and. Uh, and it, it does it does bring with it uh, not just dangers but also new possibilities and uh, and we can think about more meaningful ways of integrating people into political life um, that don't just rely on elections. I mean, the, the title of my center is the Center for Deliberative Democracy. Uh, and that, uh, and our emphasis is, is on uh, meaningful communication uh, encompassing citizens and leaders, um, not just in election campaigns, uh, but, but, but all the time. And so we've been, um, uh, so we, we've been experimenting with different, um, uh, different, different reforms, um, different ways um, in which um, members of parliament, for example, can uh, uh, can connect with their, their constituents um, in deliberative forums. Uh, uh, various sort of, sort of deliberative innovations that um, that, that, that can involve um, uh, uh, lay citizens, so things like citizens assemblies, citizens juries, um, trying to figure out how to scale up those things to to the to the macro level. Um, because we, we again we have we have um, some evidence here that um, uh, that some of the very people who are, um, are most alienated from politics, um, if you give them the chance to participate in something they consider meaningful um, and consequential, um, they actually jump at the chance, and and so that's um, that's a potential again these it's a it's a long game. It's not going to make a difference this year. Um, but uh, I think it's important to explore those, um, those those sorts of participatory, different participatory possibilities that don't just involve yeah. voting in elections. Lena, over to well, you. Well, yeah, um, yeah, it is true. Democracies tend to be complacent and only act at the, when uh, when uh, pushed by a crisis or the or the other. And what I mentioned about the defining your sort of democratic core obviously should be done in, in good times. There is a country, uh, I, I saw Pat there in the audience reminded me, there is a country in Sweden, for example, that there is, um, uh, they have this, uh, the process that if the government, say, would propose a change in the fundamental rights, that triggers a process that would allow 10, ten uh, members of parliament can suggest a delay of 12 months. Obviously, the government could push that through, but at least you would be sort of buying time. It's an institutional device to buy time in case somebody is threatening your fundamental rights, kind of state of democratic emergency in a way uh, declared. But at the end of the day, I think um, if there is a democratically elected leader determined to push through undemocratic changes, yes. any, no, any constitution or institutional design at the end of the day can prevent that. But there is what maybe can be called sort of decent measure of democratic commitment by the people. Um, and I think there is a good example um, of recent example from Indonesia that's going to the polls this year. Last year, President Jokowi was rumored at least to be contemplating to um, extend uh, to third term, which, is, which was unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. um, He's, he is denying this, but anyhow, his, uh, the idea was put out there to test the waters, and there was a tremendous pushback by the people, and he backed uh, away from, from, that, from that idea. So at the end of the day, it is the democratic commitment of the, of the, of the society that uh, is the last, <laughs> I guess, the last uh, save. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I do have one more question, and I will just direct it to um, to Alex and Chris because I'm just interested in your thoughts on on what all this or what we've discussed um, oh, lately um, has been for Australia's national security. Can I lead off with you, um, Alex? Uh, look, I think um, it's an interesting one because I think when you think about democracy as a concept, I think that's a still people value that concept. The fact that Russia bothers to have sham elections suggests that they, you know, at least see that there's a value in the concept itself. So I think I think really what you end up with is this kind of idea that if you've got um, a liberal kind of regimes or perhaps a retreat from democratic engagement in countries or, or countries that are um, paralysed for one reason or another and are not seen to be delivering on, on uh, the social contract, essentially, the, the sort of the idea of rights and responsibilities, you end up with uh, poor social cohesion mm -hmm. in, internally. Uh, and you can end up with um, political kind of instability, social instability that may not manifest itself directly, but which makes it difficult for governments to do their jobs. So uh, you end up then distracted and unable to necessarily plan ahead or to really focus on the threats perhaps you need to focus on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Chris? I'd say with the, with the changes that we've seen, we need to get away from the idea that we're protected by our geography because we might as well be right next door to whatever country uh, is you know, promoting or experiencing this destabilizing activity. So uh, to give you a, a recent example, the war between Israel and Hamas, I mean, that has divided society here, mm. right? That has mm. put people in a position where elected officials, where what they're going to say is not necessarily going to change will we'll not necessarily change what's going to happen over there, but it can really make, it can really uh, damage their standing with their constituents here. So we are living through this, uh, this material that's coming from around the world. So we're, we're not, uh, we're not isolated from it. We're not insulated from it. Um, so for that reason, we do need to think about how to counter this and how to think about it strategically. And I think as John, some of the examples that John gave about how the, the U.S. could learn from Australia, I think that that serves us very well. It has a tendency to reward the non-radical speakers in the democratic system. But even then, day to day, you know, it is a, it is a, uh, it's a it's a inherently divisive sort of media or I should say media social media environment that uh, people are operating in and it's something that the government here is going to have to get serious about and to think about strategically how do you how do you um, how do you how do you allow people to participate in their democracy in a time when they are they are being confronted with incredibly divisive information and they're able to choose their own information. Mm. How do you do that? Because, because democracy in this way is a process. And, and sometimes I think, sometimes I think that we've done this rush to whatever the latest technology is, we embrace it. So we talk about AI, we talk about social media. Is it possible that for something as important as democracy, we actually take a step back and say, actually the media of the 20th century su suits us better for democracy because it's centralizing in nature. And we need to have that one moment of consensus when we're talking about this one political issue or this one political event. So is it possible that there could be a learning curve in that way where we'd say, look, you know, on these issues, we we tend to look more at this type of media rather than social media, and to, and not try to win it as a battle of TikTok influencers. But you know, yes. and and having said that, there's a lot of concern right now about deep fake. I mean, it's very possible that the real effect of deep fake technology is just going to further jade the public. It's not going to be. There aren't a lot of situations where it's that effective uh, today. It's that effective to changing elections. Those could come, but if if we have a situation where increasingly the information out there is synthetic, we'll, we'll get to the point where almost everything online is fake, and then we'll just start looking for more authentic sources of information. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just jump in on that to say that we're already seeing that kind of liar's dividend as well, which is the flip side of that, which is a fake information or leaks that a politician can then say, well, that's even if it's real, well, that's oh, yeah, fake. That's that's fake, fake yeah, yeah, right. So you yeah. know that is that's the Trumpian kind of call to mm. to arms. Um, so it works, it, it sort of cuts both ways. I think I'm paraphrasing Mariah Carey there. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, on that note, we will move to questions. And uh, with your indulgence, can we take it up to seven o'clock? Great, okay. So I've got some questions online and uh, and we've got people in the room to take um, questions in the room. But I'll go first to this question. It, it just for everyone here, please, questions. We only have 20 minutes for questions. There's a lot of ground to cover, as you know. And uh, we'd like to get as many questions in as possible. So please, questions, not statements. And if, you've have, uh, if you can direct your question to one of the uh, panellists, that would be great. Lena, I've got one from you from online. Can I start with you? Uh, Lena mentioned corruption. This is from Louise. But what of the role of organised crime in elections and politics more generally? Are there any particular elections that stand out at risk of infiltration or influence in this regard? And how might it manifest? Um, I'm sure there are, and probably in the area that, uh, or the continent I know at least of, which is the Latin America, uh, where the, of course, the role of organized crime um, is is prevalent, but also the criminalization of politics, uh, also in Asia and the Pacific region, where we have seen more and more the the immunity, parliamentary immunity, <coughs> is attracting in in many contexts. So we do see. Um, people with, uh, uh, with convict, uh, convicted criminals um, who, who are tending to, eyeing to become uh, members of parliament so as to be, uh, be able to be uh, safe from, uh, from that. So um, it certainly is a worry and increasingly so, um, but, um, but organized crime as such, if anyone is here an expert on the Latin American politics, feel free. I think that is the really a real worry in how it's infiltrated the whole political scenery there. Yeah. Anyone else on that? No. Okay, can we have a question from here? Anka, start with you. Next. Hi, Anka Broderson. Another question for Lena. Um, I have a concern about short termism, the yeah. views of how long of our politicians think. Is there any evidence for at least Western liberal democracies, forget about some of the autocratics, about the relationship between the frequency of general elections versus the quality of democracy, i.e. in America, you've got two year congressional terms that are always campaigning versus fixed four year terms, for instance. Hmm. Interesting one. Not that uh, I can think of. I mean, short termism is a, it's probably one of the biggest weaknesses of democracy for sure. And uh, like if you, when we look at the election manifestos or the content of the, the uh, that these elections this year are being uh, probably won, issues that affecting the, the planet are not amongst those for sure. The climate change or climate crisis seems to be disappearing from the electoral uh, sort of manifestos of, of this year, really revealing one of the biggest weaknesses of, of, the, of democracy, which is the short termism. But whether there is a link between four years or six years, that um, I am not aware of, uh, of studies of that sort, unless yeah, John, John, you have better information on this one. Um, on short termism. Uh, yeah, of course, um, short termism is a problem with uh, the problems for elect electoral democracies. Uh, we, we can we can actually we might sort of think about um, institutional innovations, which uh, might induce a, a longer term focus. And there's uh, just one uh, one one in particular in which, uh, uh, which 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 is which is striking is that um, uh, that uh, citizen forums are composed of. Um, Sort of more or less randomly selected um, citizens, so things like citizens' juries. Um, uh, they, one, one thing we do observe in them is that there there is a much long. It's much easier to induce a, a focus on the the long term in uh, in, in those those sorts of bodies um, because, well, I mean, perhaps not surprisingly, um, they don't have a focus on uh, on on, on re-election. So um, there is a question. Well, how about institutionalizing a role for those sorts of um, those sorts of bodies in political life? Um, there is a there is actually a, a, a movement. There's um, something called the Sortition Foundation, um, and then uh, there's a number of different books on this um, now, which are we're actually proposing to constitutionalize the role of uh, of randomly selected citizen bodies and uh, you know, giving them a place in in government. Um, not necessarily on a, on a par with um, 
with 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 Parliament, but as part but as part of the institutional architecture, and uh, in and actually in at least this, this hasn't happened in any national government, but in some local governments in Belgium, this is now a part of um, it, it's it's part of the local institutions, and and so uh, and this and, and we have lots of evidence that this does actually um, enable a much greater focus on on the longer term, uh, but trying to figure out the place of those in relation to a representative democracy is is a challenge. Mm. I, I mean, my, one suggestion I've made is that. Um, uh, we should actually um, choose several members of the Senate, the Australian Senate, by random selection. Um, that would at least introduce uh, it would just introduce a very different body of people um, in, in, into the uh, in, in, into the Senate. Um, and I, I, it might sound like a radical challenge, but it's much less radical than the proposals that I've that I've also seen of um, uh, of replacing upper chambers of parliaments by randomly selected citizens. Um, and and that one one thing, well, uh, minimal versus maximal, maximal. But I think you would get a, a a much stronger focus on the longer term than you get uh, of chambers composed completely of people who worry about the next election. I've got one from Owen um, um, online. Thanks, Owen. And this is probably for Lena and uh, and John. Uh, are states which have uh, non compulsory voting systems at greater risk of democratic decline than those that have compulsory voting systems? It's a great question. There are questions. Okay. I, I, yep. I can't yeah. Do, do you want John? Go, go ahead. <laughs> uh, there's actually very few very few countries have compulsory yes. voting. Um, Australia is one one of the. Few. There there are two or three more. I'm not even. Do you know who they are? Ireland, yeah. Belgium, yeah. yeah, Brazil, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, obviously, the the case of Brazil suggests it's not a complete, uh, uh, not complete pr protection. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't think there is a correlation necessarily there. Um, it seems compulsory voting works perfect wonderfully here, uh, less so in many other countries where, where they do have a compulsory voting. Um, Thailand has fairly high voter turnout. It's compulsory, but even you ask from the random citizen, they wouldn't even know that it's compulsory. There is no consequences other than if, but if you are planning to run for parliament yourself and there is a track record that you haven't voted that makes mm. you are no longer eligible but uh, if you are just a normal citizen it doesn't affect you much at all uh, but I think uh, there are other other factors that affect the uh, voter turnouts um, we have again Sweden often 84 percent not not compulsory voting uh, but I think what compulsory voting is uh, advantages is that it really forces uh, to think through, think carefully, how can we actually make sure that everyone is entrenched, be it uh, you are out of country voting, internal absentee voting, all that, because now a lot of people do get disenfranchised because of the reason or the other. The election management bodies are not, they don't need to cater for all people because it's, it's not compulsory and hence uh, uh, that's, uh, so that, that's where I can see the the link um, that compulsory voting could be a good um, good push for introducing uh, uh, the uh, necessitating that EMBs really cater for everyone. Yeah, so just That's on the, Sweden, so non compulsory, eighty four percent turnout around that time. Yeah, yeah. So what's what's ha, I guess what's the famous the commitment to the democratic uh, <laughs> is it non civics mm, yeah. cultural or a, I think that's a separate um, mm. conversation. Mm. Uh, but just top line, what are the key elements there in Sweden? Is it a strong civics education program? Is it probably um, I can see Swedes in the audience, but I, I'm not from. As you can maybe detect from my accent, I'm from Finland, a neighboring <laughs> country. We have a fairly high water turnouts as well, but not as high as as in uh, as they have in Sweden. But yeah, no, I think it's a long tradition of democratic tradition, um, strong civic education. Uh, yeah. Okay. All eyes on Sweden. Okay. <laughs> um, just here, and then I will go to the left. Hi, um, I'm Melanie from the Epoch Times. I have a question for Alex. Um, so given the um, the amount of misinformation and disinformation we know is on social media and the challenge to um, for governments and um, policymakers to address it, um, there's, a talk, there's talk of disinformation bills. 
Mm -hmm. um, so you also mentioned that for governments to properly address and protect democracy, we need um, social cohesion and everyone to understand the key pillars of democracy and what we all share in common in that. Um, so do you think these di disinformation bills are the best, best approach to tackle these challenges of mis misinformation? misinformation and disinformation, or are there other ways such as um, education, civics education, um, to preserve the buttresses of democracy where we have, um, I guess, freedom of thought and freedom of, of information is one of those key pillars of democracy. So um, will these bills potentially be a double-edged sword where you have um, protections, but also you lose a lot of freedom um, and otherwise, I mean, yeah, Ch communist China is a good example of a country that does um, have sense that kind of censorship. So what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Um, yeah, thank yeah. you. A lot to unpack there. But I think <coughs> broadly speaking, of course, legislation is one tool, uh, as is education. They, I think in reality, this is a complex problem. The solutions to that will be online and offline. Inevitably, as you know, uh, it will depend on the clauses in that legislation um, one of the issues that always comes up around the ACMA bill is the one that you're talking about there, I think, combating legislation, uh, combating misinformation and disinformation proposed legislation there. Uh, and in the same way, you see that with social media moderation and requirements on social media to, to moderate all the principles that they develop themselves. Inevitably, the, one of the reasons that that is such a tricky concept is that you do get straight into the, to the idea of, well, what is freedom of expression and what is disinformation or misinformation. So um, that is why I, you know, when I was asked to pluck one of those things out of the bag was essentially saying that education is a really big part of it. That way you're giving people the tools to make the decisions themselves. Um, not to suggest that, uh, that, that there may not be a baseline at which you are actually asking, uh, say, for the social media bill that you're referencing there. A lot of that, uh, the clauses there are around having social media companies report on what they do <coughs> to combat that, what they, you know, whether they, when they find authentic or uh, inauthentic accounts, yeah. rather, whether they take them down. So it's kind of more about trying to get a sense of the quantum of the problem and being able to track those patterns through time. And I think that's understanding a problem is sort of the first stage to combating it as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. This gentleman here in the green top. Yep. And then. Thank you very much. Um, do, just to whoever wants to answer this question, um, do you think one of the links between youth disengagement in politics and the susceptibility to populist or anti-democratic movements is the declining and low rates of participation among young people in community activities such as community activities and groups such as charities, sports club, faith clubs, faith groups, and trade unions? Great question. Who wants to take that, Chris? Yeah, just, yeah, it could very well be. I mean, if the if the perspective on the world is through the prism of social media, and and this decline that you, I mean, it's across all organized clubs. People think it's just religion. It's you know everything, bowling clubs, you know, all these all these different organizations. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that 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 could possibly also be having an effect on the political experience because people don't encounter people that are different than them as much and see that they're they are citizens in the same society yeah. that are coming to you know coming to a situation from different perspectives but but both you know that they all deserve respect and that they all you know deserve their to be heard and to to have their rights respected so yeah and i think that there could be a link yeah well, okay. yeah uh yeah, the uh, American political scientist um, Robert Putnam wrote a book called Bowling Alone, which is where the, <laughs> the bowling, yeah. bowl, maybe the bowling yeah. reference came, came in. Uh, and and this this was he's been writing over several decades. But um, but based, yeah, his, his basic point is the, the decline in uh, uh, in membership of social social organisations and uh, and then what he calls it social capital and the decline of that and the uh, bad consequences for democracy. But one of the other things he found um, was that uh, it wasn't necessarily Encountering people from uh, diverse backgrounds uh, that that um, that was good for political participation. Um, in fact, he found that encountering diversity was bad. That was was demobilizing, uh, and that that's a that's a somewhat un, unsettling finding. Um, but but 
yeah, I mean, the, 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 the kind of individualization of, of life that um, Putin talks about, talks about is diff, you know, def, def, definitely a trend with I think, major consequences major consequences for democracy. And, and in a way, that's, you know, neoliberalism, neoliberalism did that as well. Um, uh, by seeing, you know, Margaret Thatcher, there's no such thing as society. It's just individuals that matter. And uh, I, I think that's, I think that's probably, that's destructive in many ways. Mm. This gentleman here, the white shirt. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, so most of this discussion has been focused on um, trends in Western democracies. So I'm just wondering whether um, non-Western democracies are seeing similar trends and problems. Um, I mean, globally speak, uh, every region obviously have its own trends and particular issues. But if you take a sort of a bigger global picture, uh, the sort of advances and declines uh, on democratic declines globally um, are happening also in, in, in all parts of the world. And I'm mainly talking about democratic South uh, or, uh, countries that, uh, that fall into sort of that category, be it in Latin America, Africa, Asia and the, and the Pacific. Um, I'm talking about the, the, the democratic trends um, uh, here. Um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, there are some, uh, mainly the sort of positive uh, um, developments that we've been seeing in the field of uh, progress made in anti-corruption measures, they have mainly taken place in Africa and, and parts of uh, Asia and the, and the Pacific. Positive, small, uh, sort of a small signal, uh, uh, not the strong signals, but nevertheless. Um, but, uh, but all in all, I do share with you, and I don't know if you, if you are of this view, actually, but uh, much of the democrat future of democracy hinges on what will happen now in India, Indonesia, Brazil, and South Africa, and, and of course, all the other countries in over the next 10 years or so. All right, we've got time for one or oh, two more questions. Just this gentleman here at the back, right at the back, yeah. Thanks. Um, question for the panel. Um, there was an article on SB about um, the Western liberal democracy's crisis of confidence. Um, do you think this is the, this is the case, um, particularly in the light of other philosophies like critical race theory, the challenge, um, the, the very foundations of some of these democracies like the US and Australia and charge that these countries are built on white supremacy. Okay. I don't know whether we'll get to all the panel. If we can, uh, who, who would like to take this question? John? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a big, that's a big question. Uh, We've got two minutes. Uh, wow. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you can just yeah, wrap I, that up. I, yeah, exactly. I, I, I must say that, uh, okay. I, I mean, even if it is true historically mm. that uh, Western liberal democracies built their prosperity and indeed had the luxury of becoming democracies um, based on uh, um, based on colonialism. Um, I think it doesn't detract from the fact that there is something very valuable valuable about the kind of liberal democracy that was uh, that was developed. And uh, uh, so, rather than just say, "Oh, it's historical," found if you if you dig deep enough in history, then uh, you can find some pretty sort of questionable. Questionable to say the least. Uh, some uh, some, uh, some some very oppressive practices, which uh, enabled the rise of, um, of of Western liberal democratic capitalism. Um, I think just uh, if 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 we if we're bringing the story up to the present, uh, I don't think that's uh, that's any argument for uh, re rejecting the, the the achievements of democracy and the and the, and the, and the model that democracy provides for everyone in the world. Uh, Alex, I was say, this I, is a nice positive way to finish I know. this conversation. I'm going to be so that be person, Gay, I promise. No, Lena, I did you want to say anything? Go ahead first, I, I, I agree with, with John's point, but basically to say that I think it's about making sure that, that whatever democratic proposition we, are, we look to in the future, it actually, pe people need to see value in it. It's not yes. enough just to say to people democracy is important and you should value it. They need to actually see the value. So to my mind, it's about making sure that we do that and broaden 
the enfranchisement so that everybody gets to yes. participate mm -hmm. in that process. Chris, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, no, I agree. It's that it's that if we relitigate the past and that becomes the basis of the present, then it becomes very hard to have a, a cohesive society without without setting aside for a moment the historical grievances that have set various peoples back. There has to be this, this gets into this idea of the shared democratic identity. How do you speak to people from vastly different backgrounds on the shared project of democracy? Lovely. Lena. It's just to say that democracy for sure can be a universal value, even if there are certain minimum, let's say minimum prerequisites or conditions that defines democracy. Um, other than other than those, the democracy can come in many shapes and forms. And I think much of the world equally freedom from fear, but also freedom from want is something that they expect the democracies to, to deliver. Okay, that's a perfect way to finish this evening. So if you could join with me in thanking the panelists, uh, please, great conversation. <laughs> These, these conversations, uh, we've all been engaged in, in them. They traditionally take about two or three day conferences. And so the fact that we've sort of managed to touch on some of the top lines tonight um, has been terrific. So thank you so much to our panellists. And thank you for all of you for uh, turning up tonight and for those online. Uh, it's great to have you here for ASPE's first event for the year and, uh, and also to, um, to engage in a discussion about our, our very precious democracy and also what's actually happening throughout the world. So thanks for being here and um, look forward to seeing you at future events throughout the year.